Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Maria Patrico and I am the manager of the main library at the Milton Public Library. Milton Public Library operates on treaty lands and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation, neutral, Huron Wendat, and Haudenosaunee people. As we center the truth and support reconciliation across Milton, our commitment to provide the highest quality service for all is inspired by First Peoples' traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies. I am pleased to introduce this evening's presentation, Engaging with Homeless Encampments Through a Human Rights Lens. Here with us this evening are Dr. Laura Pinn, Hannah McGurk, and Gita Kapak. Dr. Laura Pinn is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier University. Her research examines how social inequality intersects with policy governance regimes and how political scientists can use community-engaged research to understand complex policy problems. Hannah McGurk is a recent graduate of the Master of Applied Politics program at Wilfrid Laurier University. During her graduate degree, Hannah specialized in Canadian housing policy and co-authored an article on the regulation of unsheltered homelessness in Canada. Gita Pathak is the supervisor for Halton Housing Health. Halton Housing Health offers support to individuals and families in Halton struggling with complex housing needs. Halton Housing Health is also a broker to homelessness services in Halton region and provides outreach support to those experiencing unsheltered homelessness in, in Halton region. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session. We do just ask My name is Laura Penn, uh, and I'm an assistant professor at Wilfrid Laurie in the political science department. And I guess we just got an introduction briefly, but I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, Hannah? Sure. My name is Hannah. Um, I worked as a student um, at Wilfrid Laurie University in the Master of Applied Politics, and I worked with her on this uh, this research project. And it's a sign that you were an excellent student if a year later you're still doing presentations with your professor. I say Hannah was an excellent student. In terms of what we're going to do, uh, I've got a few acknowledgements to make. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the research question, uh, as well as the methods we use to address that question, talk about some findings and discussion, uh, a few key takeaways, uh, thank you, and then we'll, there'll be a Q&A, and we're going to do this all in 15 minutes. So start your, your timers. Um, our presentation today is on homeless encampments, specifically how municipalities in Canada respond to encampments. Before we begin, we'd like to recognize that the topic of discussion today is tied to the right to land. As such, we want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the huron wendat and the Haudenosaunee. In the report, we make reference to the role of colonialism in displacing Indigenous peoples from land, and how encampment protocols need to be more respectful of Indigenous rights. I'd also like to acknowledge the co-authors, other students, former students in the Master of Applied Politics program at Laurier, who are not here tonight, Sarah Gillies, Allison Brown, and Victoria Marshall, as well as um, Shauna Riesling from Wilfrid Laurier University, who was crucial in designing the final report, and staff at the region of Waterloo who provided valuable input throughout the process. So, unsheltered homelessness is not new. However, in recent years, the crisis of affordable housing, coupled with declines in the social support network, have led to the growing visibility of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Encampments are any area where an individual or a group of people live in homelessness together, often in tents or other temporary structures. Despite the growing prevalence of encampments in municipalities of all sizes, 
And I think that point is important, not just a big city problem, but a little city and town one as well. Um, very little is known about how different local governments respond to encampments. In the past five years, many Canadian cities have developed protocols, guidelines for outreach workers, bylaw officers, and police officers to uh, regulate how they respond to encampments. However, little is known about these protocols or their relationship to a human rights approach to housing. So this research report stemmed from a collaboration between a graduate seminar at Laurier and the region of Waterloo. Staff from the region came to the seminar requesting students investigate municipal policies in relation to encampments. So what are other municipalities doing? Um, and specifically, are there particular approaches that are more consistent with a human rights lens? And I think it's really important to note that that human rights lens was actually something that regional staff requested. Oh, did I? Oh. Okay. Um, considering municipal responses to encampments through a human rights lens is important because the right to housing has been increasingly recognized in domestic law in Canada as well as international law. So domestically, while well, the right to housing, as you may know, it's not a charter right, it wasn't there, they didn't put it in there. Um, it is in federal legislation via the National Housing Strategy Act of 2019. Uh, we've got the quote there um, from the beginning of the act on this slide. The National Housing Strategy Act commits the government to the progressive realization of the right to housing. The other way that the right to housing has been recognized in domestic law is through court cases, particularly court cases in British Columbia, that have read the right to housing into Section 7 rights. Internationally, Canada is a signatory to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as well as the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights, both of which contain language around the right to housing. So what does a rights-based approach mean? A rights-based approach to housing means, among other things, recognizing that all people, including people experiencing homelessness, have a right to shelter, and that people should not be criminalized for being homeless. With that context, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah to talk a little bit more about our research. So we begin research by outlining two research questions. First, how do municipalities respond to encampments? So what are the actual protocols that the cities have developed? And secondly, of those responses, are there some that are more consistent with a human rights-based approach than others? Um, so to examine the responses, uh, we chose various cities um, to start with of uh, varying demographics and sizes. And in analyzing the encampment responses, we relied on two frameworks. The first, Cohen et al.'s um, common responses to encampments. There's four types, um, and I'll review them in the next slide. And the second framework is the UN National Protocol on Encampments in Canada. So the first framework, four common types of community responses to encampments. Um, so we have clearance with little or no support. So clearance meaning the removal of encampments um, by the municipality without giving residents notice in advance. So maybe they're given a few days that they're going to be evicted, evicted from um, place of residence. We have clearance with support. So again, we're still talking about removing the encampments, but residents are given a little bit more time to find a temporary or permanent uh, living situation that is not in the encampment, perhaps up to 14 days. Um, with clearance with support, by support we mean there might be short-term storage of belongings, um, perhaps there's caseworkers that provide referrals for places to seek shelter um, other than the encampment. Uh, thirdly, we have tacit acceptance. So basic services are provided to the residents in the encampment. They're not necessarily sanctioned by law, but the residents aren't asked to leave. So they're allowed to stay and reside in the and lastly, the fourth common response to encampments is formal sanctioning. So encampments are permitted 
um, by law by the municipality, and oftentimes infrastructure is also provided. So that's the first framework that we use to analyze the actual protocols from the cities themselves. The second framework is the UN uh, report, a national protocol for homeless encampments in Canada. Um, and you'll see on the slide, there's four principles that we, we took from this report, uh, specifically that we applied to the, to the protocols that we chose uh, for the specific city. So the first, Principle two, meaningful engagement with the residents of the encampment, the people actually living um, in the encampment at the time. Exploring all viable options to eviction. So eviction is the last resort for the residents. Ensuring relocation. So for those situations with the two um, first typology of common responses where the encampment is being removed or cleared or torn down, what have you. Um, relocation is, is human rights compliant. And fourth, respecting, protecting, and fulfilling the distinct rights of our Indigenous peoples. So, you can see on the slide we have three examples here from our research. We've chosen these three examples um, to share with you folks today because they represent three of the four typologies. Um, so first we have Brantford. Um, so the encampment protocol in Brantford we categorized as um, clearance with little to no support. So we still have the involvement of law enforcement um, in clearing the encampment, um, and folks are not given a lot of time um, before they're informed that they're going to have to um, move out or be evicted from the encampment. Secondly, we have Hamilton. So we're still talking about removing the encampment. We still have an involvement from law enforcement, um, but we also have collaboration with um, outreach service providers to provide referrals for people living in encampments um, for um, other places uh, to see their And lastly, for tacit acceptance, we have Winnipeg. So you'll notice this is outside of Ontario. Um, I believe out of all of the protocols that we collected, this was the only protocol that we were able to categorize as tacit acceptance. Um, but residents are not asked to leave the encampment. There's outreach or caseworkers that are um, provided for folks to, to seek um, aid from um, that live in the encampment. So, um, at the conclusion of our research, we came up with four takeaways or um, four summarization um, points uh, for those that are creating their own encampment protocols or perhaps updating uh, current protocols. The first, we noticed that throughout pu uh, protocols, there was a distinction between uh, public and private land. Obviously, these are very different situations in terms of the actors involved. So when creating a protocol, um, there's often often different types of ways to deal with encampments on private versus versus public land. Um, we noted that tacit and formal sanctioning, tacit acceptance and formal sanctioning, were the ones that were most consistent with the human rights principles that we mentioned um, in the UN report on homeless encampments um, protocol on homeless encampments in Canada. Distinct and unique needs of Indigenous folks are rarely considered. So that last principle, principle eight that you saw in the previous um, slides, was not considered throughout um, pretty much any of the protocols that, that we reviewed. Um, and lastly, engagement with the encampment residents we found was key for an encampment protocol to be reflective of a human rights, a human rights based approach. about some uh, key takeaways, thinking more broadly. Um, so first, uh, there was significant variation in municipal encampment responses in Canada. And I'll note that this report only looked at five different municipalities. It was a preliminary scan. Um, so variation within five, probably much more variation as well. 
So there's a huge potential for policy learning, uh, in particular policy learning uh, between municipalities uh, in terms of what approaches can better reflect a human rights lens. Our report included 10 key recommendations. Uh, these included, you know, and I will say that these recommendations for folks working in the field of PETA uh, are probably not rocket science. A lot of them echo things that folks have been calling for for a long time. Uh, respecting the autonomy of encampment residents and making housing decisions. One of the things that we look at in the report that we didn't have a chance to talk about tonight is there's often push and pull factors that lead people to encampment. So often this idea that alternative shelter is available, um, it's not really borne out by reality. And so respecting people's autonomy and knowing what housing solutions are going to work for them. Um, some of them very simple, like using a single point of contact, uh, which is a trauma-based approach. So the idea that a resident doesn't have to repeat their story to many, many different outreach workers, but that there's a single point of contact that's sort of a reliable, consistent person to build a relationship. So those recommendations are in the report. Uh, we also note that encampments are not an adequate or long-term housing situation. I mean, we all live in Canada. The weather has been kind of wishy-washy lately. If you're living outdoors in a tent or temporary shelter, um, that's not really a permanent solution. You know, even if we are saying forcible removal is not a solution, also just encampments are not a solution, there needs to be more permanent housing. And that's something that involves all level of, levels of government. So federal and provincial levels of government have a significant role to play here. Um, and finally, unsurprisingly, the researcher will say more research is needed. Um, so more research would help support municipalities in making decisions around encampment management, just because there's very little that exists. Um, and part of the reason why I think there's been a lot of interest in this report is because it's a very scant environment research-wise. Um, so more research is needed. So I will say thank you very much uh, for being here. I'm looking forward to engaging with you more in the Q&A. Uh, there's a link on this slide to our report, Homeless Encampments Through a Human Rights Lens, which is hosted on the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. There's also a link here to the National Protocol on Encampments in Canada, which is a document put out by the UN Special Rapporteur on Housing and Homelessness. And so that might be of interest as well. And the link on the slides are the, the most handy. But, uh, Maybe those can be circulated after the talk. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Gita Pathak. I'm a supervisor with Health and Housing Health, and I'm here today uh, to engage with the report and talk a little bit about the local lens, what we're seeing um, in Halton region. And I should say thank you very much, Dr. Penn and Hannah, for that. That was a great presentation. I hope everyone else feels the same way, but um, it, was, it was great. So, um, I'll go over really quickly what the agenda looks like. I don't have a, a ton of time, but I did want to provide an introduction to Health and Housing Health, give you an idea of what we do, um, share a little bit about housing in Halton Region, share what we are seeing in terms of homelessness in Halton Region, and then talk about um, the homelessness response supports that are available through Halton Housing. So at Halton Housing Health, we support uh, individuals and families within Halton Region to find, access, and maintain housing. So this can look like a number of different things depending on the individuals and what the supports are that are required. So for some folks, um, it can be up to and including helping them with the housing search, uh, going out and engaging with landlords with them, attending the viewings, um, helping with applications for supportive housing, um, subsidized housing, all of these pieces. 
In terms of maintaining housing, that's always the goal of some, if that is possible. Um, so we would work with individuals and potentially with their landlords to ensure if there is a way that they can stay in the home that they're able to do that. Um, and then as mentioned, we are also a broker to homelessness services within Halton Region. So what that means is anybody who is experiencing homelessness in Halton Region, if they're connected with Halton Housing Help, they are important, they are um, in touch with the entire system. So Halton Region has a coordinated access system. And what that means is we all work together collaboratively. So if somebody is in contact with Halton Housing Help, they don't need to uh, run around and try and get in touch with other agencies. We're aware of the other agencies, we're aware of the resources, and we can make those um, referrals internally as needed. Um, so just a little bit about housing for some context. So I like to think of it in kind of three streams. Uh, the first being emergency shelter. If somebody is in a situation where they really have nowhere else to go, then um, that is something that's gonna be available. There are some factors, as uh, Dr. Penn alluded to, why people may not be able or may not be willing to access shelters. Um, there's subsidized housing, which um, is sometimes referred to as rent geared to, rent geared to income housing as well, and then um, private market housing. And what this is, is basically anything from a landlord who's got like hundreds of buildings to a single homeowner who has a basement apartment or a room for rent in their house. So in terms of shelter options um, in Halton, uh, we do have a couple options that are on the screen you'll be able to see. Generally, it's split up into there's uh, male shelters, uh, female shelters, uh, families, and then women or families that are fleeing domestic violence. Um, now again, not everybody is able to or is willing to access um, these shelters, which is why we'll see people in such situations where they do end up unsheltered or and or in a camp. So subsidized housing really quickly in Halton Region, this is called HATCH, which is Halton Access to Community Housing. It is the um, most affordable and the most stable long-term option. However, with the housing crisis that we're experiencing, there are obviously a long wait list um, for subsidized housing options. And that is the same across um, Ontario and really across Canada. Um, so what most people have to do is they need to access private market housing uh, while they wait for a subsidized housing uh, offer that could be available to them. We know it's difficult to access. Um, right now, the demand for housing is much higher than the supply that's available. It's created a really competitive market, um, and in part because of that, the rents that we're seeing are really high. So in terms of housing affordability, I just wanted to share a couple numbers. So Halton Housing Help, um, every month we go through and we see all of the active listings that are available within Halton. So we're able to take an average of this. This number is from December 2022, um, and you'll see the average rental for a one bedroom apartment was 1750. So just as an example, somebody, if somebody's on social assistance receiving Ontario Works, the typical amount that we would usually see them receiving is 733, assuming they're getting their full check. So as you can see, that leaves quite a gap. Um, this would lead a lot of people on social assistance to look at shared accommodations, which is renting a room. But I'd also like to share those numbers with you. So what we're seeing in Halton Region, just to rent a room with somebody else in somebody else's house, the average is 895, again, this is December 2022. It's an average, you can get a little higher, you can get a little lower, but it doesn't really get low enough to be affordable um, for these folks that are on social assistance. So that kind of leads and gives us a little bit of context into why we're experiencing um, the increase in homelessness that I think we're seeing. Um, so I just wanted to refer to the point in time count um, and so what this is is back in 2021 we as a system got together and we did a, a count we tried to enumerate the number of people that we are aware of that were experiencing homelessness on that specific date so it's not a monthly or an annual total this is on one specific date um, and that number was 293 that we identified that were individuals or heads of households. 
Um, and this is a minimum number. It is not everybody. Um, first of all, it is only people we are aware of, uh, people that we are generally working with. So, and there could be people out there that we're not aware of or they are not approaching us for supports for any reason. And it also doesn't include people who are at imminent risk of losing their housing or who are precariously housed. Um, so that is kind of what we think of as the minimum. Um, so just a little bit of the homelessness response in terms of halt in housing help and what we do. So if we become aware of an encampment Often it is um, a community agency that's reaching out to us, um, and often it is somebody from the community who's brought it forward to whatever agency they're familiar with. So the first thing we would try and do is go out to the encampment and try and engage with these individuals. Um, we would explain the supports that are available and uh, offer our supports. Of course, it is up to the client's discretion if they would like to work with us or not. Um, we are a support agency, so we're there to provide support. We obviously are not involved with the enforcement, and that doesn't fall to Halt and Housing Help. And of course, we always offer client direct support. And then just in terms of our outreach team and our outreach response, so we do have two outreach workers on staff, um, and so the first thing that they would typically do is try and help individuals access shelter if that's something that they're open to. So we know that there can be barriers for folks to even be able to access shelter. We'll try and problem solve and work around those as much as we can. If somebody, if that individual is not interested or not willing to go into um, shelter, we would still, we would first kind of assess for the basic needs, make sure those are being met. met. Does this individual have food? Do they have water? Do they need more clothing? Do they know the community resources to access? Um, those kinds of things. And then we would still provide the housing support where even if they don't want to go into shelter, we can maybe look at long-term permanent housing instead. That does take time, obviously. Um, and we try and work with our community partners and reach, um, uh, lean on the individuals that we can in terms of mental health supports or supportive housing vacancies, um, anyone that we can. So I just wanted to say that um, the report uh, being discussed today, we are seeing a lot of those things happening out on the front line. Um, that is uh, definitely our experience as well, I would say. Um, and so of course we're seeing that accessing housing can be challenging and difficult for a lot of folks, especially at this time. Doesn't seem to be getting any better. Um, and so I think we are seeing that increase in uh, homelessness. Um, that many of us are seeing and I think that until we address some of the um, issues and barriers that folks are facing that's not going to change anytime soon. That is my presentation. Thank you so much for your time today. participating in the discussion. So my first question for the panel is, what defines a human rights perspective to homelessness? I know you touched on it, but what does it mean to you? And I don't know if you want to start with Nora and then Sure. Uh, thanks for that. So uh, that's a really great question. Um, I think what defines a human rights approach is the idea that all people, it, all people have a right to shelter. Um, and the way that the courts in Canada have interpreted that, uh, particularly in BC, has been if people do not have acceptable alternative shelter, uh, they have a right to take shelter on public land. So there's a, a known court case in Prince George. Uh, there's one right now working its way through the Ontario court system as well uh, in Waterloo Region. I see a few heads nodding. Um, so just simply that you don't have to meet conditions, you don't have to be a nice person, you don't have to be a good person, um, you don't have to meet any sort of standards to access housing. You have a right to housing. Now we know, we know, and all of us that work very hard for our housing, 
Um, but that's not really how it works in practice. And the way that the international commitments that Canada has signed on to function is they commit Canada to the progressive realization of the right to housing, so to slowly moving in the direction of all people having housing. Whether or not that's actually happening, I think, is the subject of quite a bit of debate, but maybe I'll leave it there. Um, but if you look at renters too, and those that aren't renting, so are homeless, or probably would be experiencing homelessness, um, is also something to consider. Yeah, the, I, I think that kind of covers it. I, I think from my perspective, what uh, the one thing that I would add is I think that um, with the human rights perspective, we really have to consider everyone within the community, and I think we have to, in some way, make sure we're supporting and prioritizing for those who are most vulnerable within our communities, which I think I, I would argue that those experiencing homelessness and unsheltered homelessness, we have to count as those who are the most vulnerable in our communities, and so we have to make sure we're prioritizing support for them. Thank you. Um, my next question is, all three of you mentioned uh, and brought up issues around the complexity of this issue and the importance of collaboration. So I'm wondering how important collaboration is to facilitate both the establishment of effective protocols and for uh, addressing the situation of people experiencing homelessness and living in Canada. Can you definitely start with you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think that's um, something. So Halton Region uh, moved to the coordinated access system, and I can say that that has been a huge help to those of us who are trying to support individuals experiencing homelessness. It really took getting all the partners together on the same page and working in a coordinated fashion so that we can best provide those supports to those individuals. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think collaboration is great. And I know I was at a municipal policy conference with municipal service providers in December. Um, and a lot of interest in this topic in particular because it's something that municipalities are having to respond to on the ground in a very immediate way even though the problems are not necessarily the doing of municipal government. They're structured by broader levels um, of government in terms of their policy choices. And so uh, something that was a lot of interest at that policy conference was right now, Waterloo Region is piloting a hybrid indoor-outdoor shelter model, so it's essentially a sanctioned encampment site. I, I believe the first municipality in Canada to do this, so I, could, I know it's definitely the first one in Ontario, uh, so lots of interest in learning from the way that Waterloo Region goes about this. Um, mistakes that will be made, um, successes. Does this better meet the needs of certain folks? Uh, so yeah, collaboration is so important. Yeah, I think um, even from the academic perspective, um, you know, we, when we were um, drafting our report, obviously we were looking into a ton of different resources, um, and all of the research. I mean, there's a key theme about engagement with um, the community, engagement with the residents, the people that are actually, um, the policies actually, or the protocols actually influencing. Um, so I think just ensuring that you're always keeping in touch with the community, um, and you also mentioned um, Indigenous sustained rights as well, which I think is, is a really important to note to, um, you know, going above and beyond to make sure that they are being Laura, you mentioned the decoupling between support and reinforcement. I think you just mentioned that as well. Do you want to expand more about the decoupling between support and, and enforcement? Yeah, I think it's really hard. Um, I think if people are living in an encampment, it's the result of a system's failure. Multiple systems have failed. Housing systems have failed. Social support systems have failed. Quite often, health systems have failed. Um, and to Engage with an outreach worker in an honest way, honest about your needs, honest about what's going on. It's very difficult to do if you're fearing a punitive reaction from that outreach worker. So if that's the person that might be reporting you to police, 
Um, and then, you know, you might have to deal with an officer, things might escalate, your belongings might be destroyed. So this idea that, you know, how do we support people in encampments while recognizing that living in an encampment is wholly inadequate without moving immediately to the solution, which sounds so simple and easy, is to just remove them because then the problem goes away. But the problem doesn't go away uh, if that person is not being removed because they're accessing appropriate, stable housing. Did I tell you mine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just wanted to add, I agree with that 100%, and I think it's so important. Oftentimes, folks that are in encampments have already been let down by the system numerous times, and it can be quite difficult for our outreach workers to build that rapport with those individuals and to have them trust them. So if they're out there trying to build this trust so they can provide support, but at the same time, they're coming down on them with these punitive measures, as you mentioned, that's not going to work, that's not going to build the trust, and that's not going to put them in a situation where they can best provide support for these individuals. I have one more question for Hannah, and then we'll also have other questions from the audience. Uh, Hannah, in your report, there, there's a discussion where you talk about criminality and how that's related to encampments and homelessness. I wonder if you want to just touch on that and explain it. Sure. I think um, I think both Gia and, and Dr. Kim um, just kind of segued into this, um, but I think there's there's this intimidation factor um, when when encampment residents um, are dealing with outreach workers or law enforcement because they think and and, and we see it in the media, we see the way in which we speak about our homeless populations. Um, there's a criminalization of homelessness. Um, and we talked a little bit about it in um, in our report too, but even in some of the laws we see on the provincial level, the Safe Streets Act, um, the laws almost poorly reflect the homeless population. They're almost you know created for people that do have a residence, do have a place to live. Um, so I think keeping in mind sort of debunking that criminalization of homelessness or people experiencing this is a great first step in the work now. Do any audience members have any questions? Um, sure, I'm going to do it for the So when you do ask your question, if you feel comfortable, please uh, speak it into the microphone so that we can make sure we can. So obviously we don't come from a research lens, but we uh, work and support with folks in these situations quite often. So um, I guess what I would be sharing is a little more anecdotal um, based on the information from the folks we've worked with. Um, they're, the folks often that are in encampments have experienced some kind of trauma and they've often had some kind of negative experience at an, uh, a shelter that is one that comes up quite often. Um, we uh, do see a lot of folks who um, have uh, like a pet that they're not willing to be separated from and unfortunately most of the shelters are not set up to take in animals that are not like a support animal or a service animal um, because it is a congregate space so that is a challenge. Um, there are a lot of rules associated with shelters typically um, and so for some people it fit their, um, what their needs are at the time, and of course location, obviously. Uh, Halton is a large geographical place, um, so for an example, um, the only men's shelter is in Oakville, um, and I know there is a, a church in Georgetown that's doing in out of the cold program, um, but we do see some people are, are very tied to their communities, and they um, are not 
not really are able to kind of move and to fulfill with their communities and act in their own um, So there, there's a lot of different reasons. I'm not going to pretend I can uh, speak for everyone and share all the reasons, but these are uh, some of what we've heard. We're a good tag team because I can see that, and all of that is supported by research. <laughs> because there is a large body of research that does look at some of those barriers to accessing the shelter system. Um, uh, pet uh, spaces for couples, um, really restrictive rules. So shelters close during the day, right? And so you can be there maybe from 8 p.m. to 7 a.m., something like that. Um, limitations on belonging, uh, substance use, right, which can be complicated in a number of ways. Uh, and then this question of, well, if you're listening to us on our soapboxes, what do people in Canada actually think, I think is an excellent one. And I will say that this particular report was informed by municipal policy documents and some research that spoke with encampment residents, but we didn't do that research ourselves. Um, Kitchener and Niagara region both have a lived expertise working group. So people with experience of homelessness that serve as advisors to the local government. And I think it's a really neat initiative. And one of the things that the Kitchener Lived Expertise Working Group did quite recently, they invited um, city staff and counselors to one of their meetings. And they set it up as though they were coming into a shelter. So they stopped them at the, they were in security outfits and they stopped them at the door and they screened them and they made them go into waiting rooms. Um, and I think it was, you know, a arts-based way of really hitting home that the experience of going to a shelter can be and I know shelters are great. We need more of them. They're, they're excellent. Shelter workers do amazing jobs. But some of the rules that are in place can be very restrictive and dehumanizing for folks at the same time. I always, I always talk to them. Um, thank you for coming tonight. It's been very informative. Um, you mentioned the three emergency shelters. I just missed the third. Uh, so that's first question. Second, are they all full in Halton? Like at present, third. Is there anything the public can do about donations? Can we help, or is this all government-based and we don't have donations? And then fourth, just kind of, just give me a picture. What, what, I don't know the big word about that, but what is your average person like that is visiting a shelter or needs homes in Halton? I have heard there's an increase in women, elderly. Okay, I'm gonna try and remember all the parts of that question. So in terms of the emergency shelters, uh, Salvation Army Lighthouse, that's for um, men, single men. Uh, Wesley, um, that is uh, single women, couples, and families. And then Halton Women's Place, which is women and families fleeing domestic violence. Uh, are they all full all the time? They're full quite often, yes. Um, I won't say all the time, there's movement, um, but as we see, for someone to move out of shelter, typically they need somewhere to go. <laughs> um, and because of uh, kind of uh, some of the items I went over in the presentation, that becomes more and more difficult, and it is becoming more difficult. Um, so working together with the other uh, agencies and with Halton Region, we're able to try and um, you know, move people into supportive housing. We're trying to prioritize folks as best as we can. Um, but there's still just so much demand um, for housing and especially supportive housing, I think. Um, and again, again, it's not a halting thing. This is across Ontario and across Canada and, and more really. Um, so I think those are the big challenges. Um, seniors, yes, we're seeing an increase, uh, not just in homelessness, but just in need. Like we get a lot of calls that are just coming in through 311 and seniors have been on the, the rise for sure. Um, there are housing options for seniors, but again, like everything else, there, there's just simply not enough. And did I hit everything? Donations. Donations. Yeah, so some of the shelters um, do accept donations. It's more, um, I, I probably shouldn't try and speak for shelter because we're not a shelter provider. Um, so I, I do believe that most of the ones in to do accept donations and then there are you know community groups uh, like there is the church in georgetown that's trying to do the out of the fold program and that's volunteer based from my understanding um, so i think it is depending on the community members to come come in and, and want to help out um, and then i would say most of all is just being engaged and being aware of what's happening making 
this known, you know, when there are elections so that we know if housing is a dire need, this is something we want to bring forward and to be able to support our community in that way. Just from a research communications approach, when you see articles in the media about homeless people, just be really critical about them and think about the usage and ask the questions that you're asking how we can help and how we can step away from stereotypes to solve the problem in, a, in an evidence-based way. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say one thing. I think we one of the questions was, what is the typical uh, homeless uh, person? Like, I, 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 I really hope to hear the answer to that. Now, I, I, I find the, uh, the fact that you talked about the, uh, the human rights in particularly you were talking about the case in Prince George, that's alternative housing, then um, they have a right to uh, public ground in the library center. So um, I wonder if uh, public ground can be any, any municipal land or is it like a provincial land? What type of land? And do they get to choose? Because when you talk about the, there's a case in the Kitchener Waterloo where they, they, um, they, they have these, these encampments, does that extinguish rights to of other places. So we can, they can, I mean, let's say Belton, can they use the library? Can they use um, you know, the Tandy station, for example? Or is, is, is there any, uh, or does the uh, municipality or the college or whoever the authority uh, get to choose where they go? The second question I have is you talked about uh, indigenous issues. I wonder if there's any Aboriginal right or any, uh, uh, or, or, or anything like that uh, in the city of like Belton. Okay, I can uh, speak to the first question, I suppose. Um, so kind of uh, the typical person experiencing homelessness. Um, what I would say is that when we did the point in time count in 2021, Halton Region put together a whole dashboard and it talks about all of those people that were identified as homelessness within the system. Um, I can send it along if people are signed up. I don't know if we can share information, otherwise it would be available online on Halton Region's website. Um, so it was the point in time count last done in 2021, and it has all the demographics. It's got male versus female, what the age groups, uh, the reasons why their housing broke down, how long they've been experiencing homelessness. Um, I, I do have it here. I, I just I don't have all that memorized, and I don't want to misspeak, but that information is available. Um, something that I've noticed in the literature uh, and also in my own work, so I have done some work directly with people experiencing homelessness, but not through this project, is, and I don't think we talk about it enough, the co-occurrence of homelessness and disability. So a lot of people have disabilities. You know, I don't think there's exactly, I don't think there's any one type of person that experiences homelessness, but I think the experience of disability is there and is very concerning, uh, especially when we think about just a disability justice perspective. Um, in terms of this question, you know, well, if folks have a right to seek shelter on public land, could they shelter anywhere on public land? In the middle of the library? What about like on the slide at the playground? I'm not a lawyer. Uh, what I know from the legal cases is that the courts have looked at balancing different interests. So balancing the interests of other users of a space with the needs of people experiencing homelessness, and that's impacted the way they judge situations. So in the case of Kitchener, or uh, the encampment at Victoria Street in Kitchener, probably one of the things going against the municipality's attempt to have the court say, yes, you can remove them, is that it's a parking lot. A parking lot that's not being used right now, although there's potentially a future use for it. As opposed to, let's say, a park, where maybe you have different weight, weighting of different users. Um, but something else that folks have talked about in a human rights approach is that not all potential uses of a public space are equal. So a use that goes to fulfilling a human right, a rights-based need, should be weighted more heavily than a use that does not. Um, again, what that looks like in practice, I think, is complex. But even in BC, the courts have not said, you know, well, folks can then be anywhere. I'm trying to remember. Oh, and then in terms of the, well, maybe I'll just pause actually and ask Hannah if you've got anything you want to add, and then I, I can certainly address the Indigenous issue a bit if we have time. Well, we kind of just 
<laughs> yeah, I think you covered it. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the indigenous issue, it's really complex in the Canadian context because um, the Indian Act, the historic displacement of indigenous peoples from land, uh, the residential school system, all of these things are reasons why indigenous people are overrepresented in terms of people experiencing homelessness and dealing with housing precarity. So you have that kind of colonial context. Milton, I don't know as well, but in terms of Waterloo, Kitchener, Brantford, these are also located on the Haldeman Tract, and the Haldeman Tract is not a settled question. So there still is an ongoing legal case with the federal and provincial governments and Six Nations around ownership of those lands. And so you have these dimensions where the experience of homelessness and forced removal of a person experiencing homelessness who's also Indigenous intersects with these um, ongoing, historic and ongoing aspects of colonialism and questions of land and land rights and whose land. And so it becomes, I think, very messy in practice, but I do think if we're serious about our commitments to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, if we're serious about having Indigenous rights recognized in the Constitution, which they are through the Charter, um, through sections 25 and 35, then I think we need to, you know, smarter people than me, hopefully, weigh some of these questions. Um, this report is to inform there's there's a policy makers and to help guide policy going forward. So how do you see this report as a tool to be used to help shape municipal policy going forward and then maybe make an impact on that? Mm -hmm. um, so I think one thing is just documenting in one place what different municipalities are doing. I think that in and of itself has been a resource. So I've heard from people in Toronto, people in Peterborough, who are working on these issues locally, that the report has been useful for them. I think the other thing that's useful about it is because we don't, we're not part of a local government, we're independent researchers, we can come out quite strongly and say, you know, without worrying about hurting someone's feelings necessarily, these approaches are better than others. And so trying to really ground some of the existing responses through a human rights lens, I think that is useful. Because I do think most municipalities, they want to, they want to be respectful of folks. They're trying to do the best they can, but they're facing a lot of pressures, right? Encampments are unsightly, there are very valid safety concerns, so there are pressures towards a more forced removal approach, and so I think this can provide some uh, evidence of slightly different approaches that could be uh, worked into the way that those municipalities respond. I don't know if you have any, like, if this is what the report. Determined that uh, architects had a very good handbook on habitation, and uh, we could probably offer some source of information or source of uh, work with projects or, or something like that. We're currently in the research stage, trying to find out what an architect can do. which we were talking about earlier because I don't know that anyone has thought to you know, contact uh, you. Um, but I can definitely show some contact information. One reason why we hold this series is so that people like you attend and we can hook up researchers with community members and put in applications to get funding for such opportunities like short pet grants and those sorts of things so that you can talk and can put together a plan on how to proactively uh, both contribute to literature and form like things, but also to figure out how we can make activities happen. So please talk to me after. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I uh, just want to ask a, a question a bit turning more to the encampments. I'm trying to address it first to Dr. Pinnick and I think maybe pull it a bit more towards the area. 
So is this when you first developed the report when you chose your, your sample cities as part of your research scheme? I'm just wondering, what are some of the criteria that led you to choose the communities that you did? Uh, is it um, just percentage or cases of the candidates that come from the media? Did you consider the fact that the municipalities may have municipal, regional, provincial, or SCP that they need to give an enforcement response? Or different provinces and different public health systems or local integrated public health systems that might affect their response? So it's just a bit curious about that. And I was also wondering about you, you listed four kinds of enforcement responses that are most common. I noticed that we didn't see any examples of the fourth one, which was sanctioned. And not to make this the one in Winnipeg with the tacit approval. And I guess both of the, those two speak to either a longer term with the tacit approval or sanctioned even more structured with more formalized agreements of support workers, social workers who can come in and help. I'm just wondering. Where else have we seen these? Is it the United States or other places that have come up? And what does that look like? And I guess, just turning it to Gita, if you have any thoughts about, if you have an encampment that's there for a longer period of time that's not been immediately removed, who are the kinds of people, social workers, clinicians, people who can address concurrent disorders, who are the kinds of folks who help out and can come in and support these folks if they're not immediately going to be leaving in one or two weeks? So sorry for, I was trying to make it address all I think I can take on the, the first piece of that. Um, time as researchers and resources. So just a little bit more context um, for the report. We had about a semester to, to complete this. So um, it was about what protocols we could find. Um, once we were able to find um, protocols, some of them were difficult to find. They didn't come right out and say, like, this is you know, how we're going to um, you know, we had to dig for, for some things, um, but once we did um, demographic and size, so we kind of wanted to, that's how you see us trickle into um, different provinces as well, um, you know, look at some municipalities that are mid-size, smaller, larger like Toronto. Um, so that's, I think that kind of answers to me your first question. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that does. Like, And so the choice was also driven by cases that staff at the region of Waterloo were interested in. So they were very interested in Winnipeg. So we have this awkward, we've got four Ontario cases, or five Ontario ones, and then Winnipeg. Uh, because I think they had heard something, they weren't sure what was going on, but they had heard that something a little bit different was happening in Winnipeg. Um, so right now, I'm um, applying for a research grant to expand it because it's the case selection is an exploratory study. Right, and so it, we tried to get a variety of, of cities in terms of size, as well as the ones that the region was particularly interested in. But definitely, a little more robust set of cases would help. Um, in terms of sanctioned encampments, so one that I know about locally is a better tent city. So there aren't a lot of examples of sanctioned encampments in Canada. There's one in Kitchener called the Better Tent City, which is a tiny home um, and governed by a not-for-profit. There's a lot of examples of sanctioned, I shouldn't say a lot, there are a number of examples of sanctioned encampments in the United States, especially the western coastal states, so Oregon and California. Um, these vary. There are other typologies that categorize them somewhat differently, and so looking at the degree of autonomy residents have in the encampment, um, but it's more of a thing in the U.S. than in Canada. Sorry, can I get you to repeat your question? So, oh, <laughs> so busy listening. <laughs> well, sorry, I, I guess just from your experience, maybe if it's a short term encampment to a longer one, who are the kinds of folks who, who can go into encampments, right. engage, right. provide services, uh, have some sort of clinical or social work back? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, we would start with our outreach workers, start with that team, have them come out and try and make that initial engagement and connection, and then we would kind assess um, individual by individual what kind of supports they uh, would be in need of and would be open to. Um, so I think someone like you know, CMHA, Canadian Mental Health Association, would be a great starting step, depending on what the needs are, and then connecting to other community resources, um, where it does help that we work in coordination with so many different agencies, because we can kind of see who's going to be the best 
announcement or direct them that way. And sometimes um, a local agency, right? Um, like somebody who's an admin might want to um, access different supports than somebody who's in Burlington. So really try to keep it within the community. I'm not sure if I'm going to get this out properly, but thank you very much for bringing such um, uh, serious issues to the front because we all like to ignore and with that in mind, what one of the persons that's on your site said, and you touched on about political will, um, how can we move forward thinking of your evidence to have some political will to accommodate and um, build a better community going forward? We live in one of the fastest growing parts of the country, and it's not going to slow down. How do you put forward? Breaks on it a bit to say, wait a minute, it can't be all happening in the process. Any suggestions how to get it? All of us have a voice, all of us who are privileged enough to have our voice. Thank you. Um, I guess starting with just being involved, like coming here today is the, the perfect first step, right? Um, if it's something you weren't already aware of, or uh, maybe, maybe just not the details, and now you are, and now we can you know, share that information. Um, definitely with the policymakers, with um, local governments like uh, local um, MPPs or, or anything of that sort, just show that this is something that is a, a concern and we do want to see it rectified going forward. Um, and I would think supporting the research, right? Like I think uh, the more research we can have around this, then the better we can go to our policymakers and explain why we really need to, you know, have human rights approach to um, encampments in and support. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, sure, support the research. <laughs> keep, me, keep me at work. Um, I would add, though, that I think a lot of the solutions we've seen provincially have really focused on private market housing development, um, which is understandable because lots of folks are struggling or their kids are struggling to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And it's usually put in terms of buying a house, right? As this sort of this goal that we all have um, to own a single detached dwelling. And there's not as much attention to what researcher David Lachansky calls the second part of the housing market. So people who are low-income renters or unsheltered. And those folks are probably not going to have their needs, needs met through the private market. Um, not even through purpose-built new rentals because of what Gita demonstrated so well on her slide that the, the disconnect between market rate rentals and income for people on social assistance or working minimum wage or people who are on fixed incomes because they're retired, it's huge. And so we really, I think, need to look politically at who is putting forward building more non-market housing for people in need and support folks that are trying to do that. I mean, anyone who does research, housing and homelessness research knows that there's a need for more non-market housing. Wait lists for supportive housing I'm not sure what they are in Milton, in Hamilton, they're 8 to, to 12 years, in Toronto, they're 8 to 20, you know, in Waterloo, they're 7 to something, depending on what your situation is. I, I know personally people who have been on housing wait lists for like 6, 7, 8 years, uh, there just is not enough social housing. Hi. Um, I'm curious about a couple of things. I uh, volunteer at the Cambridge um, Homeless Shelter um, the Bridges program. I started recently. I've done donations for somebody who's talked to me about it in the past. Um, right now, I'm just helping in the kitchen. But I have a business background, and I've done a lot of extensive volunteer work and fundraising across a lot of areas. How I learned the program tonight was I was looking at social enterprise courses. I work for Lori, and I happen to find this link. I'm up on the road to check it out. I guess one of the things is I volunteered to help with fundraising for the Cambridge Shelter and basically create a social enterprise. And I found, I guess I'm curious how I interact with social workers and different people because I was suggesting a lot of things and they said, that failed. Oh, you can't do that. And 
We can't raise more money than X number of dollars. Because if we do that, we won't get the medical aid or we won't get the government support. And I can see that a lot of people would want to get involved with the social enterprise. I guess the last part of the question is, are you aware of any very strong social enterprise programs in Canada or the U.S.? I don't know. I, I probably can't speak that well to the dynamics. I will say that I think it's hard because a, it's just people have tried a lot of things, and so I really just am so encouraged to hear that you're you're bringing a fresh perspective and trying to make suggestions. And I think that's amazing. And thank you for volunteering. That's also is just wonderful. Um, in terms of social enterprise approaches, um, I do know of a few social enterprise style cafes. So like the Salvation Army in London, Ontario runs one. Um, there's also one up in Dufferin County that's run out of the Edelbrock Center. And so they try and use them as transitional programs to employ folks that maybe have labor market barriers um, and sort of transition them maybe into more stable or ongoing employment. Um, and they run as not-for-profits. The other thing I might mention is there's union co-ops, uh, a not-for-profit uh, housing cooperative that's in Waterloo region and has been trying to purchase housing with the goal of maintaining it affordable. And then there's also uh, a number of land trusts. So in Toronto, there's the Parkdale Community Land Trust, similar goal of sort of this social enterprise approach to housing, purchasing up moving houses and keeping them affordable in perpetuity, sort of stewarding those. Those are some of the things that come to my mind. You probably already found the stuff on the Laurier website about social development and social programs, so I'll find those people who are at the Alpha Career Kids Center. Also, there is a national database, the Community Economic Development, so it's CED.net. They also have a uh, large estate of community economic development and social enterprises as well. And I think the, there's a program at Sound Good University uh, that, that really dates into that, and they do have some corresponding options. So if you're looking to learn about that, Creator, bless you. Creation, bless you. Bring us closer to this truth tonight. You mentioned a little bit, very briefly, about the connection between homeless people that are experiencing homelessness and disability. Is there a correlation or a connection between mental health and this population? Can you speak on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think first and foremost, if uh, you weren't experiencing any mental health concerns before experiencing homelessness, you sure are going to afterwards, right? Um, so I think that's something we really have to keep in mind. Homelessness takes a toll mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually um, on folks. So um, I'm, I'm not surprised um, at the correlation, and I think it makes sense when you kind of think about it from that perspective. Um, Folks who are, uh, a lot of folks experiencing homelessness um, have experienced trauma as well in their past, right? So um, I think those barriers kind of combined um, would speak to the, the disability piece or It's exactly what I would have said. Homelessness is debilitating. So it both, you know, uh, worsens existing health concerns, including mental health concerns, and creates new ones for folks. And it's part of sort of, um, I think, maybe a negative spiral, right, in terms of people's well-being, where if somebody does become homeless, then it can really have a detrimental impact on their ability to get out of that situation. Uh, and then, of course, the other piece is that, of, I don't know if you find this in your work, Ida, but it's something that it definitely comes up in the literature. Sometimes to qualify for support, you need to meet a certain threshold of need. So you need to be homeless, not just in danger of becoming homeless. If you're homeless, you need to be chronically homeless, so homeless for a certain number of days. And so sometimes you actually, until you get further into it, can't access the supports you might need to get out of it. So there's lots of complicated factors intersecting. Yes, I think there's time for one more question. Okay. 
several of them. Is there a time frame that uh, we can look at uh, when a person becomes a couch patient or comes in or a person that draws a uh, space in somebody's house to the time when they are on their own? Yeah, so I know there are a lot of resources to try and prevent homelessness. It's a big part of the work we do. Well, I kind of talked about maintaining housing, um, so that's something we are really prioritized. Um, through Halton Region, there's also the Housing Stability Fund, which can provide um, some assistance with trying to maintain existing housing. The best, um, the best case scenario is, of course, going to be to prevent um, someone from experiencing homelessness for the first time, and if they do experience homelessness, to have it um, just happen kind of the one time and for a short time frame. I think right now um, the issue of homelessness is just so large already. It's just we're, we're just trying to kind of make a dent in it. And in an ideal world, we would be in a situation where if somebody was on that brain, we could kind of bring them into shelter and have a housing opportunity available to them. Um, but we're just so far behind where we need to be in terms of resources and housing that um, it does become number of years like on average or um i i don't know but i i know that previous homelessness is an indicator of potential future homelessness so i know that um, for some folks once it's experienced the first time it does increase the likelihood that it could happen again but is that something the, the research can speak to yeah about so of people who experience homelessness ever about 70% are episodically homeless, so they might have that one episode and then never be homeless again. And about 30% end up being chronically homeless. And there's a definition of a certain number of days over a certain number of years. I think it's 70-30, it's something close to that. And so in terms of that 30%, they tend to um, just take up a lot more of the system resources and have multiple barriers that make it more difficult for them to acquire housing. So for some people, they may just, it may happen once, like they have some influence of tragic events. Um, and then for others, it's an ongoing cycle that could be, as you pointed out, many years. I, I would think so, because if you're talking about, um, you know, kids or youth who've been through that already, there's a higher likelihood that, you know, they could experience homelessness again in the future compared to people who haven't, who have not had that previous experience. so much everyone for joining us here tonight, um, especially to Rita, Dr. Pinn, and Hannah uh, for sharing all, all their research and information with us. And um, we'd like to invite you to our next lecture on February 15th, Understanding Special Investigations Unit Race-Based Data. And more information will be available on the Milton Garden Library website. We hope to have a recording of this lecture up on our YouTube page, the Milton Public Library, and any um, research information and links will be shared in the emails. Anyone who's registered for the Laurie Milton Lecture Series um, email. So if you're not, you can find that information on theinspire.ca. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. Appreciate it.